All right, welcome everybody. We're so excited to have Doug Dean here, closing attorney and name partner with Schaeferts and Dean. And today, Doug is going to talk to us just a little bit. The question is, we are talking about real estate contracts here in Georgia. And the question is, there are various levels of breach, but the remedy for that breach is not necessarily termination with protection for earnest money or termination under no penalty. One of the examples I gave is uh, a buyer terminating a contract, asking for their earnest money back because they said the seller did not leave the utilities on, so the seller breached the contract. So that's the question I posed to Doug. Take it away, Doug. Thank you, Dana. The idea with breach is that one party has failed to fulfill part of the contract. The question, and this is where it gets tricky, is, is it a material breach so that the non-breaching party has the right to terminate the contract, get their earnest money back, or avail themselves of whatever remedies they have under the contract? Whether or not it is a material breach is a judgment question. Only judges get to make judgment question, judgment answers. So ultimately, whether or not something is a material breach is going to be a question for a judge or jury to determine. Uh, but generally speaking, we look at it and say, what's the severity of this breach? What was the severity that the utilities were not left on? Well, it was a hassle. Uh, it, you know, it was a problem, but it really didn't fundamentally affect the buyer's right to um, purchase and occupy the property. The same thing comes up with repairs. We have repair stipulations in the contract. It doesn't stipulate that the repair will survive closing. What if the repair is not done before closing? Is the seller's failure to do it a material breach? Kind of depends on what it is, the magnitude of the repair, and ultimately what a judge and jury will decide if it is a material breach. I had a uh, buyer and seller arguing over a special stipulation which said the seller to provide copies of utility bills, and that was all it said. And the buyer said the seller breached because he didn't give me utility bills. The seller said, it didn't say when I had to give you the utility bills, I was going to give them to you at closing, but you didn't get to closing because the buyer breached. And it didn't say what utility bills, so I assume last month's Georgia Power and Water Bill and Gas Bill are sufficient. So they each sort of got wrapped around the axle on, uh, on this particular special stipulation. But the takeaway is just because one party does not comply with the actual letter of the law of the contract, even though it's technically a breach, we have to determine whether it's a material breach, which gives rise to the party's remedies under the contract for breach. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Doug. As a broker, you showing agents, when you are showing a property and you see something like the utility is not on, because as Doug mentioned, it has it does not impact the buyer's ability to purchase and occupy the property. However, if a buyer has a due diligence time frame, it it does impact a buyer's ability to make the determination if they're going to continue on with the contract or terminate because they perhaps can't do one of the inspections that they were going to do. So you need, you buyer's agents, you need to protect, when it's something like that, that's obvious that you see at the time you're showing the property when you're writing the offer, you need to address that in the offer. And as a broker, I'm not an attorney, Doug's the attorney, but as a broker, what I suggest is you write a special stipulation and tie that into due diligence. Now, your first inclination, because I know y'all, I've seen your contracts, is to say due diligence to begin upon uh, uh, notification that seller has turned on all utilities. First, that sounds great, right? However, what happens if you never get that notification? Can you terminate the buyer? Can the buyer send a termination? They can, but they'll default. They'll lose their earnest money. And you're like, well, they're default. They're terminating on due diligence. No, no, no. You wrote due diligence hasn't started yet. It doesn't start till they get notification of utilities. 
So you buyer's agents, you need to protect the buyers when it's something you absolutely need the seller to perform in order for the buyer to make their assessment to terminate the contract or go through with it during their due diligence investigations. So the special stipulation, and Doug, I'd love your blessing on this, is due diligence period to begin upon binding agreement date and to extend for X number of days, seven days, 10 days, eight days, whatever, after buyer's receipt of written notification that all utilities are on and operational. That way, if you never, if you get a, a, a seller that goes AWOL and never hear from that seller, your buyer can go ahead and terminate and get their earnest money back under due diligence. But if the buyer wants the property and it takes the seller a few days, five days or whatever to get the utilities on, then the buyer doesn't have to spend money on an inspection until you get that written notification that all utilities are on or operational. Then they can go hire an inspector, pay money for that, and still have that negotiated number of days after that written notification to then have their inspections. What are your thoughts on that? It's very good language. What it does, uh, and to Dana's point, it starts due diligence because we have to have due diligence in effect to terminate under due diligence but the due diligence doesn't run out or expire. If we said 10 days of due diligence and the seller never turned on the utilities, we'd run out of due diligence. But the special stipulation reads that due diligence begins at binding date, but is automatically extended uh, for seven days after the seller gives notice that all the utilities are turned on. So now, whenever that is, and that could be two weeks down the line, now the buyer's on the clock and has seven days from written notice from the seller that the utilities are operational. That would be something also if you buyer's agents, if you're a buyer, if you have a contract, an offer on a, or a contract, an offer, because we're, we're writing special steps here at the offer stage, on a property that has a homeowner's association and you have no idea what the fees are because the seller has, the listing agent or the seller has not included or completed the community association disclosure. Some of those fees could throw your buyers out of financial uh, wherewithal to be able to purchase the property. So that stipulation, same thing. Do, tie things into due diligence where a buyer can terminate for any or no reason. So again, due diligence to begin upon binding agreement date and extend for X number of days after buyers receive a fully completed community association disclosure form by seller. Anything like that, that your buyer has to make a decision on in order to go through, decide to, to pursue the purchase or terminate and get protection, get their earnest money refunded, start it at the beginning of the binding agreement date and extend it for something like that, that you as an agent, an experienced real estate agent, professional looking out for the best interest of your client, know in advance that some of those fees might impact your buyer. If you don't get that until after due diligence and your buyer terminates, depending on, um, you know, it could be, they could still financially qualify. So you might not be able to terminate them under a finance contingency, but they don't want that extra expense. So things like that, utilities, um, community association disclosure, um, things like that, that you know a buyer is going to want to assess. Now, Dana, to your credit, you've written most of these special stipulations and they're available on your website, correct? Correct. If you go to, um, if you are a Maximum One agent, they are in the reference section of Paperless Pipeline. If you are not a Maximum One agent, thank you so much for watching this video and email me and I'll be more than happy to share that. And for all agents, never use a special stipulation that you hear in a class, in a sales meeting, without running it through your own broker and getting permission from your own broker. The three rules for special stipulations, limit their use to when they're truly necessary and don't conflict with the same uh, matter being addressed elsewhere. Use GAR pre-printed special stipulations. Or RE form special stipulations. Whenever they apply. And if you need a special stipulation not covered in the pre-printed materials, get help from your broker or closing attorney to make sure it addresses all the uh, matters that need to be addressed. Consequences, survival, things like this. Notices, termination rights, what happens, earnest money, penalties, things like that.
Thank Fantastic. you so much, Doug. Thank Appreciate you. it. My pleasure. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Bye. If you like that video, check out the one here. If you like the content on this entire channel, please click here to subscribe. I try to take even the most complicated of real estate situations and make them crystal clear. See what I did there? Real estate made crystal clear. Thank you guys so much for watching.